Good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Well, it was a few months ago when I said that I was cutting down my typewriter collection to just the essential typewriters that I really wanted to use, enjoyed using for creative writing. And then a funny thing happened. Uh, a few weeks ago, I wandered into the shop of John Lewis, the master typewriter mechanic here in Albuquerque, who's been uh, repairing typewriters for about as long as I've been alive, probably. I ended up testing just about every typewriter that he had on display for sale. There were two machines that stood out to me. One was a 1945 Smith Corona Sterling. It had probably the nicest touch, the softest touch of any of the machines there. But this particular machine really struck me. This is a 1960 Optima Super made in the DDR, made in East Germany. So it shares with its stablemate, the Groma Calibri, the uh, privilege of having been manufactured in uh, Soviet-occupied Germany during the height of the Cold War. Ended up taking this machine home. I really love the touch, the style, the quality of it, and the typeface, as you'll soon see. Stay tuned. So the version of the Optima that this represents is the post-1957 version, which is sort of generically called the Elite 3. It's actually from 1955 onwards. Uh, it's the Elite 3 version. And then in 57, they did a few more styling changes. They made the space bar a little narrower than the older version. So the older version, you'll notice this frame out here is shorter. The uh, space bar and the uh, tab buttons go out further. And then also they made a few changes back here to the paper table up here. That was the post-1957 changes. But Production of the Optima Elite 3, which includes the Super and a few other model names, uh, was uh, went up until 1961, at which point uh, the production was shipped over to Erica. So the little story of Optima and Olympia is after the war, after World War II, of course you had the Soviet occupation of East Germany and the Western occupation, if you will, of West Germany. In 1951, uh, Olympia moved production to Wilhelmshaven in West Germany, and Erfurt, the old factory in East Germany, Optima took over. And so then there was a court fight in the International Court of Appeals in The Hague, and in around 1953 there was a ruling around the brand name. So the Olympia in West Germany could use the name Olympia, and in East Germany they had to use the Optima name. So that's kind of a little bit of a rough story there. And I'll leave a couple links down below to some blog articles that gives you a little more detail about the history of the Olympia-Optima split in uh, the 1950s. Well, let's start looking at the features on this Optima, starting with the left-hand side of the carriage. I guess we'll start right about here. Left hand carriage knob, carriage return lever. Carriage return lever was slightly redesigned in 1955, a little bit smaller than the earlier version. The uh, line spacing selection lever goes from one to one and a half to two line spacing. So in the one line spacing, it's two clicks, two half line clicks. So one tooth of the sprocket is a half line, one and a half, three clicks, or three half line clicks, which is one and a half lines. And the third setting is one, two, three, four, four half lines, which is two full lines of spacing right there. All right, up here you have your paper guide, the left-hand paper guide, and it gives you a range of about two inches, roughly a little over two inch range of motion here. Most typewriters that have the line spacing variable clutch, you'll find a button on the left platen knob, and on this one you can pull it out, but the button is actually on the right-hand side, which we'll see in a minute. The paper bale has a paper scale, this machine goes up to 85. Then on the back of the carriage, you will see the push and slide margin settings. And I really like the styling. These uh, 
curved brackets with the vertical lines, the real fine lines in there. It's just a neat little Art Deco kind of styling here. I should also mention on the left side of the machine over here is the carriage lock lever and it truly is a real lock. It will lock the carriage firmly and protect the escapement against damage. Made in Germany and there is a a label here that's indistinguishable. I don't know what it said. And then there is this DDR logo on the right hand side here. Of course, the super branding, the right margin setting, push and slide. And then on the right side of the carriage, back here is the paper release for the uh, paper bale rollers. And you have a single carriage release on the right side up here. It's in a pretty handy location. And then the right platen knob actually has the button for disconnecting the line spacing ratchet. This new style paper table is more of a chromed finish and oh yeah I should mention I forgot one of the key features here. Little tab right here. It is an Olympia style paper support that telescopes up. I should mention that these markings on the paper support can function as an end of page indicator, but it's really set up for an A4 size page rather than US letter size. But yeah, if you can kind of gauge basically where the end of page is going to happen when, when the top of the page comes up here as you're typing. And you want to collapse it completely in order to retract it back into its place down there. One of the things you might notice on the carriage is the feed roller down here is pretty far toward the front, which means you can type really close to the bottom edge of the paper before it loses grip on the paper, and that's a nice feature to have. Like many other typewriters, uh, German typewriters of this same era, late 1950s, early 60s, this is a, a carriage shift machine. And then to remove the ribbon cover, you want to push up on the front or pull it up and forward to disengage these two pins from the brackets. Okay, so I'm using a DIN 2103 style metal spools that John Lewis provided. So like the Olympias, it has the spring-loaded little finger that keeps the ribbon pack pushed in. However, it has a eyelet style ribbon reversing. So it has the forked guide and uses eyelets at the end of the ribbon right there. There's an eyelet to do the ribbon reversing. So it's more of a standard uh, kind of a setup that we might be more used to. There's your uh, ribbon vibrator. The threading of the ribbon goes pretty straightforward through there. And you might notice that the plastic card guys are spring-loaded and they're in good shape. They're not broken or cracked or anything, which is kind of uh, uncommon for a typewriter of this vintage. Um, it has a rubber uh, support for the type bars there. The type bar rest is a rubber piece in a metal frame and it feels like it's in pretty good shape. Of course John does a great job in cleaning these typewriters. He disassembles them basically down to almost the last screw when he does his cleaning and all that. I should mention right here, I don't know if you can see it all that well, let me go to the shift lock position. But the serial number can be found right here but it's also found underneath the machine. Okay, to get the ribbon cover back on, there's a pin on the back corner and engages in the slot here on this bracket. So you sort of put the back of the ribbon cover in that slot and then the spring-loaded clips in the front should lock down like that. All right, this is a US export keyboard. Uh, it has a three-quarter fraction and an exclamation mark where the when the later typewriters would have a number one. Standard kind of a US manual typewriter configuration. The uh, dollar sign is a shifted four, and of course your apostrophe is a shifted eight. Here is your uh, margin release button, shift lock, shift. So this is the tab set button. So wherever you locate the carriage, you can set a tab from here. This is the actual tab button itself where you tab over. And then this uh, horizontal line button is the all clear. So there is not an individual tab clear. There just is an all clear to clear all the tabs at once. Backspace key on the right side, you have a quarter and a half fraction, and the typical key is found on an American keyboard here. And the bichrome setting over here on the right, blue meaning the top edge, white meaning stencil, red meaning the bottom edge of the ribbon. Well, let's take a look underneath the machine. Okay, so your space bar, 
right here, you have these little rubber pads uh, that are the rests for when the space bar comes back to its rest position, and they seem to be in pretty good shape. And then you have these plastic guides where these tab linkage for the tab set and tab button run through these plastic guides, and they look like they're in good shape. You would think after all these years they'd be broken, but they're actually fairly thick, but they're also something that looks like you could easily fabricate if they did break. So one of the few plastic parts on this machine. I like the heavy-duty torsion spring that is for the space bar rod. That is pretty neat, right? And then on the spacebar rod, you have an adjustment for the arm that actually pulls the linkage for activating the escapement, right? So this is kind of an adjustable cam that you can adjust the timing of the spacebar with, which is pretty neat. I think the build quality is pretty good from what I've been able to, to notice on this machine. And you might also see the rubber feet appear to be in pretty good shape also, right? They're resilient and they're not cracked. And they're held on by two screws, but it looks like there's other holes where maybe different models perhaps had different mounting systems. And here's another feature that I've noticed also in the East German-made Groma Calibri is the little bracket for the feet is chromed. Just a little accent, but they give you some chrome there on the feet, which is pretty cool. This down here is the universal bar that is activated by whenever you type a character and the universal bar of course is going to activate the ribbon vibrator down here and also the ribbon advance on the spools. Okay, you'll notice the same serial number is also down on the lower frame here on the bottom which is, makes it easy to see and then the escapement system is right back in here. It's fairly easy to get to. It's not as bad as some machines. This is the activation of the escapement for letters right here and there is an adjustable set screw and nut and then the space bar activates the escapement via this linkage here. There's your spring motor and your draw band right there and over here is the carriage lock lever for locking the carriage. So there is this angled bracket right here in the lower right and you would think it would engage something in the uh, carrying case, but it actually doesn't. So it's maybe this bracket is built for a different style uh, carrying case uh, than what I currently have. I thought it would be fun to show you the case on this machine. So it's the profile of the case is pretty big. And um, the top half just pulls off the hinges of the bottom half. The bottom half of the case has four metal posts and those interlock into holes on the four feet, but they're very tight. Part of the reason is probably because the rubber feet, though it's not totally hard and cracked, is less resilient than it once was. And so you can uh, use the typewriter on the base like this with the caveat that you have this funky strap that's sort of sitting there and what I find works best is to rotate the strap over to the to one of the sides like that and it kind of gets it out of the way so you could use this in the base and there is a kind of a shadow of the feet uh, so you can kind of help locate when you're trying to put this back you can kind of locate the, uh, the proper holes here in the feet to seat it down properly but it is hard to push okay they're in the hole but they're not in the hole Ugh. and you have to really push on it hard to get them in there because the feet are not completely resilient like they used to okay and then uh, then the top shell oh yeah you have to lock the carriage that would help so let's do that and, okay and then the top shell comes down then we get our strap, run the strap through the handle and latch the strap like that so it locks into place. And there you have it. Um, the only caveat to supporting the typewriter on its back is the hinges protrude down 
from the bottom of the machine right here. And I could imagine you would scratch a delicate floor or a delicate tabletop if you started sliding it around like that. So if you do set it on its back, be very careful. Just remember, think about that. Otherwise, there are little metal feet here on the bottom where it will sit down like that. And this particular machine has a really nice typeface. Uh, I really like the style of it. I don't know what typeface it is. I'll have to do some more research, and maybe one of you guys out there knows which one it is. But it's it's really well formed and stylish typeface. I love the way the numbers especially look. So here is the engravings, the manufacturer's markings on the type slugs. Look, it's like it says twenty nine slash two. It perhaps isn't entirely fair to judge an entire brand of typewriter from one sample. I've obviously owned more Olympias than I have Optimas, but i got to say, I really like this Optima. If this particular sample is indicative of the uh, most of them that were manufactured, especially toward the latter part of their manufacturing run, I'm pretty impressed. It has a feel similar to the later Olympias of the 1960s, but I think uh, it's this one at least is a little bit softer, not quite as firm of a touch as the Olympias, keeping in mind, of course, that this does not have a, a touch adjustment, right? So the spring tension on the universal bar is fixed. Uh, that said, I find it for myself pretty easy to type on. And, and when I talk about ease of typing, especially touch typing, I always refer back to my the peculiarities of my particular situation, my hands. This particular machine, there is a good distance between the A key and the shift lock, and the shift lock is raised up a little bit higher than the rest of the keys here. So I have no problem typing, touch typing on this keyboard. It feels really nice. Which brings us to the point of uh, what about comparing my wife's SM3 against this Optima Super? And that is a comparison I think we'll do another day. We'll spend a good time comparing the two and seeing how we like the feature set, the touch, and all that stuff. So in the meantime, I like this machine. Yes, it's a new machine in my collection that I said I wasn't going to be growing my collection any further. But, you know, there are several issues about this. First of all, you don't find around my part of the world an Optima that often, firstly. Secondly, you don't find very often one of these in John Lewis's shop that's been gone over completely like he does it. And he told me that the, these are not very common in his shop at all. And thirdly, uh, Mr. Lewis is... 80 years old and he won't be in business for too much longer and so buying one of these typewriters from him means I'm buying a lifetime of experience put into reconditioning this machine and so I think that's worth the money and and one more machine in my collection something like this that I certainly enjoy using you know there is a number of typewriters in my collection that have a great touch they they operate well, they don't skip, they have a nice typeface, but they may not put out as dark of an imprint as I'd like. One example is the previous typewriter that we talked about in this series was the Groma Calibri and all the work I've done put into making that typewriter more usable and less trouble prone. And it comes down to it's a great typewriter to use for an ultra portable, but the imprint just isn't quite as dark as I'd like. One of the first things I noticed about this Optima is, my goodness, it has a dark imprint, really nice and dark, and an unusual typeface, really beautiful typeface, I think. So another good reason to consider getting one of these in your collection, if you can find one, that is. What do you think? Are you in the market for an Optima? How frequently have you seen one? I'm assuming here in America, uh, they're not as easy to come by. Over in Europe, I'm assuming they're a lot um, more frequently found on the used market. But if you have any experience with an Optima, I'd like to hear it down below. What are your comments and thoughts about it? And in the meantime, yes, this is a tool for creativity, and I wish you guys the very best and hope you also stay creative. Have a great day.